Hello, HDC. Woo! Yay. I don't know about you, but I'm in the mood for like a giant game of Connect Four. I just, if only we had a giant Connect Four board. <laughs> Sometimes things that are in my head should stay there. Um, welcome to church. My name's Tim. I work here. Today we are going to cover 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, Paul has been in a continuing line of thinking for chapters 1, 2, and 3, and he's going to come back to something he started with today, and I really want you to get the scope of all three chapters, uh, and what's helpful is if you see the entire scope of chapter 3. So what we've done today is there's just a couple of fill-ins, and then the inside of your notes is the entire chapter, because we want to scribble all over it and write things down. So if you came in because you were checking in kids or you came in and you, you know, giving friends hugs or you're watching the band or whatever and you don't have notes, raise your hand because you're going to need them today and we'll get them over to you. You're going to get to interact with the text a whole bunch, which is a joy. And uh, then we can go home. Um, uh, before we begin today, we're going to define a couple of terms that are important for our passage. And we're actually even going to define a term that um, Pastor Tom kind of touched on last week and then um, left and, and uh, kind of left me a little confused about. So I did some research and I'd like to share my, my findings with you today. Paddywhack. <laughs> or nucal ligament is a strong elastic ligament or tendon in the midline of the neck of sheep or cattle, which relieves the animal of the weight of its head. It is pale yellow in color. Boom. Check. Solved. And we're going to put the phone down. Now that we've defined paddywhack, uh, we're going to move on, <laughs> and uh, our next word is sarcocos. It's on the front of your notes there, and sarcocos just means fleshly or carnal. Fleshly is not a word that we would use readily in our society. There are other descriptive words that we would say. If you spent time at a fair with your kids in the livestock area, you would say that you smell stinky. Um, if you had been on the road for a very long time, you would say that you are tired, and sarkakos is a descriptive word that Paul is going to use with the entire Corinthian church today in an important part of our passage. So I wanted you to understand it. It comes from the Greek word sarx, which just means flesh. And in American culture, flesh kind of has that like overtly sexual overtone. Not really so um, in, in the Greek language. Flesh just means like, like body, like what you're made of, organic material. Okay, So that's that. The next word you got to learn, and I don't know why I still can't say it, been trying all weekend, epoikadomeo, okay, epoikadomeo, and that's the act of building, or literally just a building itself. Epoikadomeo is um, the act of building or a building itself, and it's an important thought that Paul is pressing on the Corinthian church, and it comes from two words, um, like but a butterfly is butter that flies. Um, epoikadomeo is a compound word that comes from two words, one of which you know so well. Um, oikos is a house, the material building. And it's also a household, a family, a lineage, a nation. And we've been passionate about oikos for a very long time because God has been passionate about oikos for a very long time. And it's cool to see how this word is connected to another in our passage today because that second word is doma. If you got hit in the dome playing tennis or football or something like that, you would get hit up here. And doma in Greek language is the top of a house. So ep oika domeo is like your household and its covering. Your household and its covering, that's what epoika domeo is, and we'll get there eventually. But I'm very excited to work through our passage slowly today, not so slowly that you can't go eat. We'll, we all need food, I do too. But now with those terms defined, we'd like to move into the passage today. So yeah, flip open your notes, and let's rock and roll. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you still aren't ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, well, I follow Paul, and another, well, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? That word sarkikos, fleshly, in the NIV Bible is defined worldly. 
So you see it there uh, in verse 1 and again in verse 3 and again in verse 3. I couldn't, def- I couldn't talk to you guys as spiritually mature, but you're, you're really fleshly. I-, I couldn't talk about spiritually mature things because you're not spiritually mature. You're, you're very carnal. And we have all sorts of different things that we put into our minds, like what is fleshly. Some of you guys, maybe it's like heavy drinking, that's fleshly. Or, you know, being very, I guess, reckless with your sexuality is a fleshly thing to do. But it's interesting that Paul is saying a very fleshly thing to do, a very carnal, base thing to do, is to be preferential with spiritual leaders. And we'll get into that a little bit more as the, as the time moves on. But it's interesting that this passage, this little chunk of our chapter, is a very indicting portion of Scripture. Because remember what we were taught last week, when Paul wanted to go to Asia, but God redirected him and said, no, you're going to wind up here in Corinth, he spent a year and a half there. Now, I know your pastoral team is without peer in this church, but... Paul is like the cream of the crop. And if we had the Apostle Paul teaching our church for a year and a half, you would think, wow, we would just learn so much. And he's frustrated because, dude, I spent a year and a half with you guys, and now time has passed from then, and you're still babies in Jesus. And you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, we were taught last week by Tom that we have been given the mind of Christ. Yes, absolutely true. You have just as much Jesus as I have. And that's all of it. We're taught in Scripture a number of places that, like, his spirit is poured out onto us and we're being given the mind of Christ. And that's why he's frustrated. That as a baby Christian, they have two options. They can make make life decisions like accessing the mind of Christ and, and reading the Scriptures and praying over things and seeking other biblical counsel. Or they can go with their gut on things, and they can do what feels right or what just kind of seems natural. And even though they had a ton of opportunity to become spiritually mature, they just kept always deferring to what felt right, their gut in situations. And Paul says, I can't talk to you as spiritually mature people because you're not. You have opportunity to. I mean, you can have just as much access to Jesus as I've got, but you're not taking it. And so the difference between a spiritually mature per- <laughs> the difference between a spiritually mature person and a spiritually immature person isn't like oh God blessed you with more of Him than He blessed me. Are you just taking access? Are you taking opportunity? Are you putting yourself in front of God's Word? Are you listening to it? Are you acting on what you know? Because this church should have been further along than they were, but they couldn't. And a big reason for it is the, the culture around them. It's fascinating. I know they lived in Roman authority, and this was Roman culture, but Greek culture permeated what they were living in. The Romans were very strong militarily, but they were not nearly as advanced, um, I guess, civilizationally. Gosh, that was, I'm doing terrible today. <laughs> the Greeks were fascinating in what they spread to the known world. Because for centuries before the advance of Greek culture, if you were an Egyptian, you thought as an Egyptian. If you were an Assyrian, you thought as an Assyrian. And when the Greeks um, spread their culture militarily and, you know, civilizationally, um, they spread the idea of philosophy. They spread the idea that, you know, you could have your religion stay in your area or you could be introduced to our religion. And so for the first time, individuals could begin aligning themselves with superstars. Right? You, you could choose one philosopher over another and think, well, I like his podcast a little bit more than theirs. And I like reading his blog more than his. And so now, like, in American culture, you know, okay, some people like Kabbalah and some people like Scientology and some people, you know, like Buddhism. There's more and more of a movement towards organized atheism in our um, time now more than ever. And in American culture, you can pick and choose where you go. This is a unique time in human history that as a Roman citizen but still living in a society that dripped with Greek culture... You could choose certain philosophers. Pastor Todd already taught us that in Corinth, there was a huge level of importance on athleticism. And so the same thing in our culture today. You see people walking in and around malls and superstores and all these different things, wearing jerseys, aligning yourself with a team and an individual on the team. You know, I am of Kobe Bryant. I am of, I don't know, someone else, Philip Rivers. And you would... In that culture, choose an athletic superstar to kind of identify with. 
And, and then even you guys know, because of pop culture and movies and whatnot, that then the Romans advanced that idea of superstardom with gladiators and the, and the gladiatorial games. And you would pay money to go watch, you know, NFL, I mean, gladiators duke it out with each other. And, and you would root for a certain one over others. And heroes in that culture and in our culture too, they kind of, they pull us a little bit away from our own frailty, huh, and our own shortcomings. We feel that if we can, like, select the right superstar and they always do well, then I know that I'm not amazing at what I do and I don't have tons of riches or successes, but when my chosen superstar is victorious, it kind of trickles over to me. And, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm a little short on superstars right now in San Diego and the playoffs have been just so depressing for me. But, but we do the same thing. In Corinthian culture, you would align yourself with a superstar, and their victory was your victory. Their strength was your strength. And we do it in American culture as well. We are so obsessed with celebrity. I do not need to know where Miley Cyrus got her haircut yesterday. I do not care if Julia Roberts thinks that, you know, such and such movie is super awesome. She probably doesn't say stuff like that. And maybe I should pick maybe cooler celebrities than Miley Cyrus or Julia Roberts. I don't, Michael Jordan is just like the cream of the crop in my mind as a celebrity because of whatever. All right, move on. We are obsessed with celebrity in our culture. We've got magazines for it. We've got Twitter feeds for it. We've got TV shows for it. We've got websites dedicated to it so that at all times I can know what Brad and Angie are doing. I don't care. I'm not mad at them. I just don't care. But we are obsessed with it. It's, it's leaked into a lot of um, our culture as well. I am not making a political statement about candidates or parties. I am wanting to observe what is happening in our entire political system. So I'm going to use two examples. I'm not bashing or endorsing. We endorse Jesus in this church, and that's that. So let's move on to examples. You can be excited about that. That's fine. Um, uh, the last election, um, our current president really knew how to leverage social media, pop culture, and you know, I mean, you could roll back the tape and say, you know, when Bill Clinton started appearing on late night talk shows that started that, you could, but man, it was fascinating to see his campaign leverage the idea of pop culture, celebrity culture in America, and right or wrong, I don't care, we need to pray for our leaders, the Bible says, and support them, and you know, spread the gospel of Jesus, so I'm not bashing that, I'm saying that campaign leveraged that mindset in America, and now, okay, now let's be fair, now in the Republican camp, one of the leading, you know, high-profile Republican candidates has decided to not continue a government job, but to step out of a job that will continue to develop experience, and instead be mainstream. It's so fascinating to me that being mainstream is more important than continuing to develop leadership skills and gain experience. It's just fascinating that our obsession with celebrity is affecting the political and leadership world of our country. And so now you've got to think like, man, you're right. We have a president and maybe a future president, who knows, that are like tapping into this idea of celebrity obsession in our own country. And I get it that heroes help my frailty. Heroes help my failures with their successes. I mean, I get that. It's, it's been a, a, a human mindset for a very long time. And Paul just says... That's a baby Christian way of looking at your church leaders. That's a very immature thing to do within the context of the church. And it's destructive for a few reasons, and it's silly for a few reasons, and we'll get into that. But I, we just need to start off with this, this beginning passage that a fleshly, a carnal, a base, a gut thing to do is to identify a spirit of maturity in other people and then not ever define it in yourself. So let's move on. Verse 5. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God made it grow. Let's stop and just talk about those two uh, sentences for a moment. Um, he says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? We're servants. You know, I'm out there with a bag of seeds in dirt, dropping seeds in. Apollos is out there walking over dirt with a can of water and pouring it on it. That's what we do. He says we're only servants. Our word deacon comes for that. The word in Greek is diakonos. You could circle that. And I want to explain it this way. I have never seen some of the world's most amazing guitar players play live. I have not seen The Edge or Hendrix or Clapton or, you know, Mayer or whoever. But I've been to a few concerts in my day. 
And uh, the concerts I go to, you know, there's one or two warm-up bands to kind of get the crowd, you know, parked in the parking lot and moved in and finding their seat and happy and all that. That's why they're there. And then after the warm-up bands are done, a guitar tech comes out on stage and uh, he, he, he makes sure that the guitar is set, it's tuned, it's exactly where the superstar needs it to be. He makes sure that um, the, the extra picks are where they need to be, the bottles of water, the rug is like brushed, towels are there, and then he gets off stage. And while the guitar tech is on stage, the crowd is going to the restroom. And they're getting snacks at the snack bar. They're hopping on their phones, you know, putting on their Facebook. Can't believe it, this is so awesome, glad I'm here. That's what you do when the guitar tech is on stage. And then when he's off, then the superstar comes out, baby. And he grabs his guitar and the crowd goes crazy. Everything, you know, from bathrooms and snacks lines everywhere. Everyone descends back into the arena and their attention is focused on the stage because that's why they are there. Paul says, why are you obsessing over me and Apollos? We are guitar techs. Our job is to set the stage for the big deal. And you guys are being dorky about your spirituality because you're obsessing over the guys who come in and set the stage for the real deal. That's why Paul says it this way. He says, the Lord is assigned to each his task. I'm a planter. Apollo is a waterer. Some of you guys are tillers. Some of you guys are the people that put the sticks in the ground with a little picture of the tomato and the carrots on it so you remembered what you planted. But listen to this. God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. And this is a concept that we can't teach you from the stage. We can't teach you what Daniel learned through our series. That is, Daniel was taken out of the kingdom of God, and he decided that he would live the kingdom here in his soul. And as he lived the kingdom out of the kingdom, he became obsessed and blown away by the things that God showed him because he was keeping in step with what God was calling him to. You did not have to tell Daniel, be obsessed with the fact that God is growing this plan. Daniel knew. He didn't have to go to a rally or or make sure that the worship songs were just right for his preferences that week. He knew. You didn't have to explain to Mary across that whole entire story of God moving in her life because she said, be it unto me as you have spoken. Because she said, your kingdom can grow here in my heart, then okay, I will now keep in step with you, and I will recognize that your glory is a much bigger deal than any of us. You don't have to tell some of the volunteers in our church that keep in step with God's plan, that work with our children or our teenagers or our care ministries or our mission trips, any of these things. When they step along with God's plan and say, God, work your kingdom in me and through me, they see things happen by God's hand that we didn't plan, we didn't announce, we didn't rehearse, we didn't project, and that's fine. That's wonderful because HDC has always been about the glory of God, not the glory of HDC. And the people that keep in step with these things, we do not need to teach them, hey, be more obsessed with God than our pastoral team. They don't worry about those things, but they, they, they see God at work. Your teenagers, they need to learn to drive. And at some point, you cannot teach them at the dinner table how to drive, particularly if you own a manual, a stick shift. At some point, you have to sit in the car and pray to Jesus out loud (laughs) while they turn on the key and press in the clutch and shift the gears and you are like holding on to anything in there and you're thinking, you you know, I hope hope they're right with the Lord because I know I am. (laughs) You've got to do it. You've got to do that. If you are more caught up with if church was good this weekend or if your favorite was up to bat, and you're kind of confused about this idea, like what is the glory of God other than being impressed with the church service, that should bother you. It should bug you that other people like Daniel and Mary have stepped into this plan and they get it. You've got to step into what God has for you because we can't teach you God's glory in the same way you can't teach your kids how to drive a car through explanation. We will aim to honor God each and every weekend. And the reason that we rehearse and we practice is because what our heads and our hearts have about who God is is bigger than we can ever pull off. And it's silly, like little things, me fumbling over words. I, you know, I understand that that doesn't matter, but my heart sees what God has for our church. And then I drive into my world, and I know that I've got my 8 to 15, but I drive through our city, and I know what God has equipped us to be. 
And there's this sense of urgency that if HDC develops the same mindset that is in our culture here, it's going to rot our effectiveness from the inside out. American consumerism obsessed with image and alignment and all these things, and consumerism is not part of the church. It's counter to Christianity. And so Paul is trying to press upon the Corinthian believers, the reason you are fleshly and you're still immature is because you're choosing to align yourself with Christian superstars. And it's a ridiculous thing to think because you have a task in the kingdom. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each man will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's epoikodomeo. By the grace of God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. That word is architect. And someone else is epoikadomeing on it. But each one should be careful how he epoikadomeos. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man epoikadomeos on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw... His work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has epoikadomeod survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Paul now begins to press upon us in this, this section, each one should be careful how he builds. See, the problem with superstar Christian mentality is I'm going to choose my favorite podcast or my favorite Christian author and, you know, I'm of Charles Swindoll or I'm John Piper or I'm Mark Driscoll or I'm Francis Chan because now I'm saying that those mega church pastors do the mega work and because I recognize that they're awesome, I don't have to actually build anything through my life because I've aligned myself in the right fan club. And Paul says, be careful how you build your kingdom. Excuse me, how you build God's kingdom. He doesn't say it'd be great if you would sign up this weekend to join children's ministry because that'd be neat. Or if you participated in the Rosa Sharon thing. He says not if, how. Because two months ago, you were building God's kingdom. Last week, you were building God's kingdom. And we are passionate about Oikos in your world because it's a centrally biblical idea that God is calling you to it. And we're passionate about it because you do it anyway. And I'm, you know, not the judge of you, I'm not the boss of you, but this passage is saying you're either doing a great job of it or you're doing a terrible job at it. And he defines it one of two ways. He says you're building with either gold, silver, or costly stones, or you're building with wood, hay, or straw. And this passage can be challenging or discouraging if if you interpret that God wants you to do elaborate and lavish things for the kingdom because we are a very blue-collar church. I love living in the high desert because we love our families and we love work and we love like normal everyday life. We're not obsessed with, with image and labels as much as maybe some other areas of the country are. And it'd be easy for us to think, well, Tim, I'm not a rich person and I can't do those lavish things for God. I... I don't know what God wants from me. The contrast between gold, silver, and costly stones and wood, hay, and stubble is not their fanciness, it's their durability. So if I were you, I would circle that whole section and I would write somewhere durability because that's the bigger issue at hand. You see, the culture around you wants you to focus on certain things. And so let's talk about a dad who, you know, has a good job, but he's not rich. And, he, you know, what do I do, Tim? to do things for the kingdom that are are like gold and silver and costly stones. Well, let me tell you this. When you step up and lovingly lead your wife, that's costly. Because probably your buddies have ideas for what it means for you to be, you know, a man. And there are probably things that you could do at work that, you know, will keep you away from your family and away from your responsibilities, but focused on the company, and that will make you a man. You could probably make more money and have a nicer car, and that'll make you a man. But Scripture would say that a husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church. And so we recognize, I recognize, that stepping away from some of the pushes of our culture that define what you are as a successful man. And you got to say, you know what? I need to prioritize my wife. Or f- somehow, whatever that is, I need to lovingly lead her towards Christ. That's costly. I know it. 
and you know it too. Dads, I, I, love, I love working with the teenagers, and every single month, I, I, you know, every, not every single month, every single year, we spend a month teaching the teenagers what it is to remain sexually pure and guarded in your relationships and how to guard your heart and what it is to establish boundaries and standards and all that. And, you know, the teenagers love what we do and all that, but dads, can I just tell you that when you, like, sit down with your daughter or on a ride with your daughter and you tell her, sweetheart, I value who you are as a person, And I want you to maintain boundaries because of your purity and because of God's standard and because I am proud of who you are. You blow me out of the water in an instant, like in a moment. And I'm so good with that because like your job in the life of your daughter is a bigger deal than me. It's uncomfortable. It is weird to talk with your daughter about stuff like that. You don't want to acknowledge that it's ever going to happen. It's going to happen. And so you step up and you do something costly, something valuable. Ladies, you're spending time with your girlfriends, and girlfriends, you know, talk, and they share things, and and I've heard from all sorts of different people the different pieces of advice that sometimes ladies like to give, and there's not a lot of things in our society that honor biblical faithfulness or, or perseverance. And so you could be in a conversation with a few ladies and, you know, this one gal sharing her heart and she's frustrated and doesn't know what to do. And the other gals are saying, just leave him. Just walk away. It'll be better for you. You can get some money out of him and, you know, all these things. And, and you, you feel this tugging on your heart to speak up and say, you know, God honors faithfulness and there's just something to it. And in that moment, though, you know that they're all going to think you're crazy. In the same way that the Corinthian church... Man, it's crazy that they would think that a condemned, crucified criminal could give them life. It just didn't make sense. That's why Paul spent a lot of time in chapter 2 bouncing back and forth between God's wisdom is foolishness, God's wisdom is wise, the world has wisdom, the world is stupid. He, He kept going back and forth because you and I go back and forth, don't we? We step into the church and we hear these things from God's word and it makes sense. And then we step back into the world around us and it's we're torn God, what do I choose? Paul is saying that you got to step up and let God's kingdom live in you. Quit letting the successes or the maturity or the superstardom of other people define your maturity. Because it just doesn't happen that way. You've got to do things that are costly in your walk with Christ. Not fancy. You need to do things that are durable, that are important. And can I just humbly say... That if you're not doing anything that costs you to follow Christ, it probably is that you're watching someone else live a mature faith. And you might not be maturing at all. I'm not mad and I'm not the boss of you, but it's coming from the scriptures here. These, those two phrases, receive his reward or suffer loss, those are at odds with each other and those are your two options. And we do not believe and we do not teach that if you live a, you know, a pathetic you know, self-absorbed Christian life that you're going to go to hell. We do not believe that. You're in heaven because of the work of Jesus. But what you take with you to heaven, well, that, that does reflect what you did. And some people think, well, wait a second, you, you know, I'm not going to be judged. I'm not judged anymore because of Jesus. Your work in this world is judged. A spiritually mature person understands Jesus saved me, and now his kingdom is trying to live in me and through me. That's a spiritually mature mindset. And Paul says, I can't talk with you guys about these things because you're all still picking and choosing your favorite podcasts. Stop it and start living the kingdom God has called you to, and it'll become very obvious that some of the things you do in this world matter and echo through eternity. I think it's easy for us to think that our church heroes do what they do in church and on Christmas and on Easter, but we step back into the real world and we need real world solutions And so we tell ourselves that we don't have to live the same life the pastoral team calls us to because I've got real world problems and God has his church answers for his church problems, but I need real world answers for my real world problems. And have you ever considered that the church isn't advancing in the real world because you're not advancing the kingdom in the real world? Your world probably will never listen to a John Piper podcast, but they'll listen to you. And so the church is limited only when we limit ourselves. And megachurches grow sometimes, and we are a megachurch. We need to admit that. 
Mega churches sometimes grow because there's excitement and there's growth, and then all of a sudden they kind of level out because it's easy for us to start choosing. Well, I think children's ministry is the best at HCC, and I love what they do. Man, we hand them off to Tim, and they're so whack in the teenage years. Hey, that ain't my fault. Their teenagers are whack. And, and then, you know, they come back around, and, and oh, I like it when so and so teaches, or I like it when we play this song. And rather than developing a set of convictions in mega church, we develop a set of preferences that becomes our substitute. And it's this American consumerism that rots the church from the inside out, and it robs us of our effectiveness. Paul goes on, as a matter of fact, in the passage, and he says that don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God is going to destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Let's think about this, this thought this way, that when I was in football, I played football. I mean, excuse me, when I was in high school, I played football poorly. So poorly that sometimes there were years apart from winning a game. And the kids at my school would make fun of the football team because, duh, uh, we were bad. And so they'd make fun of us. You know, on Friday, we'd go to school and they'd say, how many points are you going to lose by tonight? And we, you know, we had good comebacks, like, shut up and you're stupid. And, uh... <laughs> And it was interesting to watch a different crowd of people. Um, there were a group of guys that decided, you know, they were the answer to our problem and they would join our team. So sophomore year, junior year, senior year, new guys would show up to the team. And during preseason, they would make fun of us. It was like them and us. And like they were the answer and we were the problem. And uh, then we would play our first game and we would lose. And it was instant, instant, instant. That group of guys that had left the critics and joined the team, they stopped they stopped using time at practice to make fun of us because they knew next Friday there was another team that was probably more ready than us, and they used that week to get ready. And it was interesting to watch them stop being a critic and be part of what they thought was the solution when they stepped up and, and like stepped onto the field. And it is easy to let American culture seep into the church, and for us... To rest back on the fact that in a mega church, a mega pastor does the mega work. It's not true. I'm the guy that has the sign with a tomato plant on it. And I put it in the ground and I say, look, right here is a tomato. And today I'm saying right here, if you look through this passage, in your notes, what I did is, is we highlighted all of these phrases. Each his task. The man who plants. The man who waters. His own labor. But each one should be careful. No one can lay. If any man builds, his work will be shown. Each man's work. He himself will be saved. You yourselves. Anyone. You are the temple. Paul is pulling their attention away from him and Apollos and Peter. And his heart is trying to tell them, you are the church. And you're going to think that the superstars are awesome when you don't step into God's plan because you need the superstars to be awesome because you aren't doing anything. I'm not mad at Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie for being celebrities and being do-gooders. That's fine. Let them. But when the mentality that is they're doing good because they're rich and popular becomes part of our mindset, then we have a problem. And it's embarrassing that we're a church of 10,000 people and only a couple thousand are regularly active in their Christian faith. And so as we grow larger, one of the things that's going to help us continue to be a healthy church, not a mega church, but a God-honoring church that is more obsessed with God's glory, is when we all go home and think, okay, the guitar tech came out on stage this weekend and got things ready so that I can walk back into my life and be obsessed and blown away by who God is. And what he's doing in my marriage when I choose to step into what he wants for me. Be blown away by my kids when I step into what he wants for me. Be blown away when I watch him work in the lives of my oikos. Because I need to be obsessed with God's building, his oikodomeo. Because I am building a kingdom. Whether I'm doing a great job or a poor job, I'm doing it. And he closes with this. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he's wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool. So that he can actually become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the futile. Excuse me, the, the thoughts of the wiser futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or P Peter or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours. And you're of Christ, and Christ is of God. Verse 21, 
just so I can see the flow of it, I would circle all of verse 7 and all of verse 21 and connect those so that you see his thought has been driving to this conclusive point. You're immature when you expect the maturity of others to cover you. That's not the way it works in the church. I have lights and a microphone that does not make me a superstar, and it does not make me more mature. I can be a baby Christian as well when I don't regularly access what God wants me to do. And so HDC, we cannot... We cannot let the culture of America seep in. And when we show up in church, our default mindset is that I'm going to be choosy this weekend. I hope my favorite songs are played. I hope my favorite teacher is there. I hope I enjoy it. Because when we come in and our, our mindset is that we're choosy, then what we're going to do is we're going to develop preferences rather than convictions. And preferences will not change the world around you. Preferences will not develop a sense of maturity in you. Preferences will not lead your family to Christ. Preferences will not change the neighborhood around you. Help us to keep in step with God's glory. Help us to maintain the foundation of Christ being the cornerstone of our church. Help us to not develop big heads. Keep in step with God. Let his kingdom work in you and through you because we are building God's kingdom. Jesus should be more important to you than any of us. And so we got to keep in step with his plan. Amen? Father God, we need to remain humble before you and motivated by you so that your kingdom can live in us and through us. And God, American culture would tell us that we just need to latch on to a couple of heroes so that their successes are our successes and their strength is our strength. And Lord, it's fascinating. 2,000 years ago, the Corinthians needed to leave Corinth outside the walls of the church so that they could come in and be motivated to hear from the superstar who is you and go back out into their world and see you at work and yield to you and listen to you. And so God, help our church, HDC, not become a mega church that's obsessed with mega Christians, but God, help us to stay somehow obsessively focused on the fact that we should be moving faster than slower now and that we should be more excited about what you're doing in our life than in the life of our services. God, call us to to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.